Welcome to Sparks of History, where Jewish history and world history meet. We are very honored and privileged to have with us today Rabbi Beryl Wine. Rabbi Wine has been aptly called the voice of Jewish history for our generation. Rabbi Wine has preeminently made Jewish history alive for thousands upon thousands, all with deep insight, broad knowledge, refreshing candor, and intelligent wit. Rabbi Wine, thank you again for joining us today at Sparks of History. We appreciate it very, very much. Thank you. Uh, just to start, we're Rosh Chodesh Adar, we're approaching Purim. What historic lessons do we learn from the Purim saga, Mordechai Esther? What insights does it provide regarding anti-Semitism? I think the main insight is that anti-Semitism is alive and well, and that it uh, needs no specific uh, catalyst to burst open, and that uh, many times it comes from unexpected sources. And uh, in our time, for instance, uh, we always were afraid of anti-Semitism, so to speak, from the right, but the main anti-Semitism today is from the left. And uh, There always will be people like Haman who will use it as a vehicle for their own self-advancement, for power. And uh, because we are such a small people, we make a lot of noise, but uh, Gamora says that uh, two stones in a can Kish Kish makes a lot of noise. The can is full, yeah, I can't hear anything. So we're very small, we make a lot of noise. And uh, therefore, uh, and we are different. Therefore, uh, all of the reasons of anti-Semitism that have existed over the centuries uh, meld into one. And, uh, so there was a time that there was uh, religious anti-Semitism, especially from Christianity. Uh, today, uh, uh, the decline of Christianity has uh, allowed that also to decline. But now you have a different type of anti-Semitism. And the state of Israel uh, makes it kosher to be an anti-Semite. But I'm not against the Jews, I'm against the state. I can disagree with their policies. So it's a complicated issue. That, I think that's what Purim teaches us, that it's very complicated. And there's the hand of God in all of this. And that somehow we survive. But it is not through uh, basically how we expect it to survive. There's a, a, a statement that um, it's a halacha, it's a law, that Esau hates Yaakov. Esau hates Jacob. Yeah, that's how, a, how is this statement that's to be understood? Opinion. That's one opinion. Okay. How is this opinion to be understood? And is it an ironclad rule that governs all of Jewish history? What does it mean? Basically, it means that the forces of evil cannot tolerate good. And that uh, therefore, uh, those who represent good will always find that evil will oppose them and hate them. Now, what is evil? Evil is the thrust for power, thrust for wealth, the thrust in national. Uh, hegemony, control over others. Ideas can be evil. There are many evil ideas. Culture can be evil. Way of life can be evil. All of that opposes basically 
Torah, and in essence, the Jewish people represent Torah, even the Jews that don't observe, or they don't know what you're talking about even. But within the Jewish soul, we are opponents of evil. We've been so since the time of Abraham till today. And therefore, evil has now. Will there ever be a time when evil will be erased? We hope so. But as long as it exists, a pretty ironclad rule that evil hates good. Is it possible to come up with, let's say, the top three principles that explain or guide Jewish history? Now, you know, if you had to do one, Rabbi Ryan, one, two, and three, this is, these are, these are my rules. This is what I see governs all of Jewish history up, up until today. Number one is that somehow heaven runs the show. Even if we are not aware of it at the time, and even if it's disguised, but uh, heaven sends you uh, messengers, messages, people, crazy events. That's the famous discussion between Rashi and the Ramban, the story of uh, Joseph and the brothers. So Joseph is lost. He's looking for his brothers. He can't find them. I am so Ayoish. He found somebody. It was a man that was there. And he asked them, Did you see me? You know, 10 guys in black hats. With, where did it go? He said, Oh, yeah, they were here, but I heard that they're going to Dotan. So Yosef goes to Dotan in the story. So who is this man? So Rashi says that he's the angel Gabriel. The angel. God sent the angel because he wants this story to unfold. The dream of Abraham to be fulfilled, be in the land of Egypt, etc. This is how it's going to happen. The Ramban says you don't have to say that it's an angel. It's an ordinary man. But God works through ordinary people. So uh, somebody stops and asks you for directions, and you give directions, and out of it comes something. You're a participant in changing world history, even though you don't know what, you know, if you stop the man on the street, he says, what did he ask me how to go? I told him, go here. But that's rule one. Rule two. I think uh, what I said before about evil and good. And rule three is that the Jew people only survive through Torah. Torah observance, Torah study, Torah knowledge, Torah values. The only way to survive as a Jew is, is being a Jew. And the Jewish history has taught us that all of those that have tried to compromise them, to blend in or whatever word we want to use, you know, the uh, Haskalah said, be a Jew in your home and a person of the world in the street. None of that worked. If anything history teaches us is what works. And if, uh, you know, the famous statement that insanity is repeating the same mistake over and over again, and the Jews are very, very prone to that mistake, to that insanity. We tried it all already once. Not once, we tried it a myriad times. Whether it was in Spain, in our time in Germany, in our time in the Soviet Union, In the state of Israel, doesn't work. Golden Meir said their greatest disappointment in life was when the Socialist Union 
which she attended the, their international conference regularly, uh, voted against Israel to expel it and say it's it's an apartheid state, the reg, the, all the nonsense. He said that was her greatest disappointment. But that's a lesson in Jewish history. Why was she disappointed? What did she expect? And you see how the hand of God works in history. The United Nations, I heard this from Rabbi Soloveitchik long ago. The United Nations was created for one purpose, by heaven. That was to give legitimacy to the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine. And it did so. Now, we could never get that to happen again, right? If we have to go to the United Nations today. So there was an instant, a window, and it did it. After that, the United Nations is of no value. It still is of no value. Um shmum. Well, that's a lesson in history. So there are many, many such lessons. You have to look for them. You have to be, uh, you need an antenna to pick up the signal. So I was fortunate enough that when I went to the yeshiva, I had teachers that talked in those terms. They didn't talk in terms of uh, you know, which uh, meat is more kosher than other meat. So I don't denigrate that either. But they talked in terms of worldview. How does God operate in the world? The story of the Jewish people is how God operates in the world. So if you look at it in that fashion, so it's entirely from picture, then you get from Jewish history being taught in uh, Georgetown University or something. Picking up on that, can Torah observant Jewry thrive without a deep understanding of Jewish history? And how should Jewish history be taught in the yeshiva curriculum? The Torah itself says, Torah mots olam bin shnoz door v'dor, door, shalom v'yichu v'yagayt choskenech v'yom loch. The Torah made it an imperative to know history. The Torah devoted a number of psukim to the study of history. So uh, I, don't, I don't know how uh, one avoids that message. Now, the question is how to teach it. I want to tell you, history is boring. So if you teach it as dates and names and people and places, it's a dead end. So, how, for instance, how do you see Christopher Columbus? Well, he's born in Genoa in 1492. He uh, discovers uh, the American uh, continent. He goes home. Goodbye. He came three times, whatever. That's it. So today he's a racist. He's a uh, whatever. But that's history. If you teach history that way, that's a dead end. If you teach history with a general overview. 1492 is when the Jews were expelled from Spain. The man who raised the money, the men who raised the money for the expedition of Columbus were two Jews, Abraham Senior and Don Yitzhak Barbanel. And uh, he left to find the place that eventually would become a haven for millions of Jews centuries later. 
So that's another way to look at history. So then you look at Columbus and you say, he's an instrument of God's will. Now we don't always understand God's will because we're not privy to that kind of understanding. But there's a way to teach history. History is a narrative, it's a story. You can study the American Civil War, you'll know every battle and it'll be boring. But if, for instance, if you read the, a book like Bruce Catton, so he has two or three books on uh, the Civil War, Mr. Lincoln's Army, etc. So then it becomes alive, he's telling you a story. Or uh, Ken Burns' series on the American Civil War, which is taken from letters that soldiers wrote. It's a different kind of history. It's the same history, but it's, then, then it's talking to me. And I think that uh, I used to, uh, when, I, uh, when I taught in my yeshiva and taught history, I would say, We're, you have to imagine yourself now as your great-grandfather. Today I would have to say great-great-great-grandfather. You have to imagine yourself like that. So if you start to imagine, you don't have a car, you don't have a home, you're living under persecution, you don't have a nickel in your pocket for tomorrow. So now let's talk as to what happened. So that made a far greater impression than, a, than I would give them the statistics as to how many Jews were poor in Eastern Europe. So it, history to be taught properly needs a great, in my opinion, I'm never wrong. In my opinion, it requires a great deal of creativity. Not only that, you have to be in it. You're not teaching something. You're telling a story that you yourself, one way or another, have experienced and feel it to be important. But if you're only going to teach facts, why well, history is boring as can be. Try to make this interesting, God willing, hopefully. Um, talked about Columbus, the New World. Is there a historic precedent for the American Jewish diaspora in terms of freedom and joy, equal rights, wealth, integration, assimilation? In my this opinion, no. Every exile has been different. Uh, but the the, the American exile, uh, America really was the golden land for the Jewish people. And the Jews embraced it to such an extent that, that it's destroying them. The Talmud says that Jews do better with poverty than with wealth. That's a psychological and sociological observation uh, that has been worn out over generations and generations of Jewish life. Now, I don't advocate poverty, but I do advocate, uh, I'll phrase it nicely, you don't need six bathrooms in a house. You don't need uh, the latest uh, model of expensive cars. A little modesty helps. Modesty in terms of aspirations, too. I think part of the problem that America's created 
is the expectations are too great. And when they cannot be met, so then you have a disappointed and frustrated population. I, uh, I grew up at the end of the Great Depression and then the Second World War. And we didn't have anything. My parents never owned their own home, never owned an automobile. I mean, if you had five dollars, that was a lot of money. You didn't go to Starbucks to buy a cup of coffee. It was like one or two kosher restaurants in New York. Oh boy, Luigi Siegel. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, we had it, you know. So it's entirely. So I, I'm not in favor of going back to that, but though I think those who grew up under that appreciated America better than their grandchildren do. You look at modern Jewish history, the movements of modern Jewish history, Hasidism, Haskalah, the Muslim movement, Zionism, rise of the yeshiva world what's now and what's next what movements can you can we identify any historic movements that are happening now or do we need the perspective of time and what movement might be next coming up for the jewish people the historic movement is the state of israel future of the jewish people lies with the state of israel not Zionism. Not the state Zionism. of Israel. Zionism is over. It did what it's supposed to do. There are no Zionists left in the world. Listen, you have uh, an enormous Sotner show in almost every city in Israel. So what are they talking about? There's no Zionism left. There's in this. So now the question is, how, how will the state look? We're going through that now. This is the turmoil. This, the issue is not judges. And the issue is not reforming judicial systems, all of the noise. That's not the issue. The issue is, what is a Jewish state supposed to look like? And what has happened is, that the state of Israel has become much more Jewish. I'm not talking about observant. It's become much more Jewish than the founders envisioned it to be. Herschel thought the state of Israel would be like Guatemala. Okay? It would solve anti-Semitism. So now we know that it doesn't do that. And we also know it's not Guatemala. So where's the place of Torah in a Jewish state? I'm talking about the study of Torah. Are there limits? What is the public Sabbath supposed to look like? How do we control the marriage and divorce and domestic issues? And how do we deal with modern problems, with technology? So I, that, that's where, uh, in my opinion, that's where the, so that will arise, where there arises now, solutions to these problems which solution will last which one will become dominant that, that takes time we'll look back 100 years from now and say oh yeah that's what happened you know great jews are, have a certain sense of prescience of the prophetic vision my father of blessed memory told me he was a disciple of the great Rabbi Shimon Shkop, who was the Rosh Yeshiva in Grodna. 
and later said Shurim and Yeshivas Rabbeinu Tzvokonin in New York for two years. So my father told me that in 1929, Reb Shimon told him, Europe is done, he said. Europe is always Gishpil. Done. 29, he said. He said the future of the Jewish people lies in the Jewish community of the United States. That's why he went there to teach, because he said there has to be a Makum Teir in America the way they won't survive. And in Eretz Israel, that's what the future is. And then he said in Eretz Israel, my father told me many times, I don't want it to be misunderstood. He said, it can very well be that in the Jewish state, the trains will run on Shabbat. He said, but we'll figure out a way how the trains can run without desecrating the Shabbat. So I'm not in favor of the trains running on Shabbat. But we cannot ignore technology. We cannot ignore, you know, you can say all you want that you don't have a, couple, a phone, right? But in the real world today, you can't deal without the, these infernal machines. So how do we deal with it? What are, what are the guardrails? You know, when the printing press was invented, the Gutenberg uh, published the Bible in the 15th century. So the Bible was a bestseller. But I think the third or fourth book that was published was pornographic. So do we ban the printing press? The printing press is one of the greatest assets to Torah study. Where would, where would we be without the printing press? But the printing press today prints uh, awful things. So uh, we'll see what happens. It has to sort itself out. That's uh, one of the lessons of history is two things you don't know. And the second lesson is you may not want to know. Just let it happen. You know, you have no, no. great men made very many wrong predictions. So what? The prophet Isaiah said, uh, your thoughts are not my thoughts, right? My ways are not your ways. So once we get that, that we don't know, the Rajbo says in one of his chuvas, Rabbi Nishlomo ben Adaret, the purpose of knowledge is to know that you don't know. It's the arrogance of those who have knowledge that oftentimes destroys us. Little humility that Moshe Rabbeinu knew more than anybody else. The Torah doesn't give him credit for that. The Torah gives him credit for being modest. I think one of the lessons of the rabbinate is that not everybody likes you. That helps create a certain sense of modesty. Man met me on the street. He said, I was in the synagogue last Shabbat. 
I heard you speak. I didn't like what you said. So I said to him, I didn't like it either. But I had to speak and you didn't. Uh, patience. But I definitely think the movement, maybe there'll be a new Hasidic movement. Because Hasidic today, Hasidim today, to a great extent, is a frozen movement. It's, uh, you know, it, at one time it was the most revolutionary and innovative religious movement. Today it's uh, probably the most uh, conservative, the small c. And, uh, you know, it's got to be, you know, okay, we'll see what will happen. You know, I, I'm, I'm very optimistic about the Jewish people. We, we've seen in Jewish history um, destructive messianic movements before the Jewish world apart. Yes, my friend. Is, is there... Anything out there today that 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 could could such a false messianic movement reappear in Jewish history today? Wokeness is a messianic movement. Tikkun Olam is a messianic movement. Jews always look for perfection, so they don't call it messianic. But it's basically messianic. It's, uh, it's reaching too far. It becomes impractical. I think that that's one of the reasons why the Rambam in Mishnah Torah paints for us a very bland messianic movement. He says the, the world will continue exactly as it is. The difference will be that uh, the Jewish state won't be subservient to the nations of the world. You don't have to have Anthony Blinken come and visit us. But uh, truth of the matter is, after 2,000 years of exile, that's Mashiach. That's the, the uh, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. So we piled on all sorts of things. You know, the revival of the dead, the Rambam says Mashiach has nothing to do with the revival of the dead. And by us, uh, you know, the, uh, all the sick will be healed, everybody. Okay, so once you set the goal like that, my Rebbe used to say that's why he can't come, because he cannot live up to those. Uh, so, are they messianic movements? Yes. But they don't build themselves as messianic movements. And if you're speaking of Chabad, so then uh, depends which Chabad and uh, how it works out, you know. I don't know what the Rebbe had in mind. He really didn't have in mind. He was a great man. So uh, I, every, I'm convinced anybody that will come and say, I have the solution to economic problems, diplomatic problems, the personal problems, will have a following. People are desperate for that. They've always been. And that's why you have charlatans. That's why you have all the fakers. You buy yourself a white frock and a big hat and you're in business. Big danger. That's why... Uh, as I always said, that uh, one should not even delve into these things. And Rambam says, when Mashiach will come, he'll come, we'll all know about it. Uh -huh, I don't know.
as I do research for the site, to you know, look for speakers and participants, I'm, I'm amazed at how many Holocaust museums there are across the United States and the world, how many Holocaust departments of study there are, all kinds of levels in the universities and the colleges. How should the events of the Shoah be taught to the next generations of young Jews and also to non-Jews? How should it be taught? Well, that goes back to the original question here. How do you teach history? You can teach the Shoah with uh, statistics and numbers and fact, I don't think the Jewish people will, be, will uh, really survive because of Holocaust museums. I think it's necessary that we certainly have a memory of what happened. But I don't think that museums, you know, the, you know what the irony of it is? That uh, Hitler, the Nazis, the Germans, they made a museum of Judaism in Prague. They collected artifacts from the whole world because they were going to show what Jews, what it, there once was a people and this is what it looked like. So, uh, I, I think, uh, I don't know how to put it nicely, I think uh, museums do a great deal to assuage guilt. To soften the impact of how cruel people can be. But uh, why doesn't somebody make a museum about the Gulag? Or about Chairman Mao? Or about Paul Pot? So again, depends. Depends what the purpose is. Depends what we want to achieve with it. But all the museums, anti-Semitism is alive and well. So even though the Holocaust Museum of Washington, I think it's the most well-attended museum in the United States. Anti-Semitism in the United States is alive and well. Museums don't cure it. Okay. Just a couple more. Has there been a paradigm shift in the historically bitter relationship between the Jewish people and the Catholic Church? Well, the Catholic Church, uh, we, uh, <laughs> Professor Berkowitz wrote in 1956 a great essay, Leazar Berkowitz that we are entering the post-Christian era. And uh, 70 years later, that's obvious. Church has lost, uh, it's lost its place in the world. You see it from uh, the Catholic Church in the United States doesn't say anything about anything. Society adopts openly anti-Catholic mores, laws, political statements. You have a Catholic that's the president of the United States. The church is uh, silent. Nobody speaks out. The Pope doesn't say anything. Uh, 
the church uh, in Europe, uh, Christianity is almost gone. I mean, only about 40% of the people in England ever attend the church now. In France, it's even less. I don't think that Christianity is our big enemy anymore. I think we uh, we have lived, it has served its purpose, and we have lived to see its decline. Protestants, it depends which Protestants you're talking about, but basically uh, religion, organized religion, organized Christianity no longer has the voice or the influence in the Western world and in the United States that it once had. And that's why, there's a great deal of resentment in the state of Israel. Because basically put the state of Israel in <laughs> book. There are no blue laws anymore in the United States. You can have all the business in the world open on Sunday. When I grew up, that was not true. We were in Israel. Uh, we were, uh, I was with my family in a hotel over Shabbat. There were a lot of non-Jews in the hotel. And they were complaining that the stores are closed. They wanted to buy souvenirs. So we're certainly swimming against the tide. But we've always swam against the tide. It's just at certain times, the tide seems to be with us. When I grew up in America, we thought the tide was with us. In the cultural values, the legislation, so even though there was anti-Semitism, but, you know, America was America. But that, that uh, it's unraveling, and we see that it's unraveling in front of us. The lost tribes of Israel, who are they? And are we witnessing a return of some of these lost tribes? Is this happening now in Jewish history? Could be. There are lots of different Jews in this country. <laughs> Could be. The Talmud tells us that many of the lost of the ten tribes were uh, brought back to Jerusalem and Judea by the Novi Yirmiyot before the first temple destruction and that they were absorbed into the general Jewish society so that there are uh, undoubtedly descendants of the ten tribes amongst us today. But uh, the legend that the ten tribes are beyond the river, etc., that, that's I don't, I don't, I don't uh, think that that's accurate, and I don't think that that. Uh, there have been a lot of uh, phonies that have uh, appeared in Jewish history that played on that, and being from the ten tribes, come from a river that spews fire. I don't think so. But uh, I, I, I personally feel that uh, there are many Jews who are descendants of some tribes in those things. In, in conclusion, personally, what projects, everyone, um, are you now working on? What's, what's well, coming up next? Uh, I, I wrote a book about. Uh, the Musaf prayer of Rosh Hashanah. 
The book did very well. Called Majesty, Memory, and Resonance. It did so well, it sold out all of its copies. So I'm reprinting it for this Rosh Hashanah. But I've written a new book on the prayer of Ne'ila, the final prayer of Yom Kippur. And uh, I hope that uh, that book will be, uh, I'm God willing, it'll be available. Nice book, I like it myself. And uh, I have a full-length documentary movie on the life of Don Yitzhak Barbanel, which I've just completed. And we're going to have uh, showings here in Israel and in the United States. When is that coming out? Uh, April 15th, right after Pesach. The documentary. Yes, it's but it's um, just a beautiful film. And uh, your people who are able to, uh, uh, it's like Netflix, you can get it on your computer, right? And the, you'll go to my uh, Destiny site, the Jewish Destiny, and order it, and I'll, I'll send you the link. So that's coming out. I started another book on, uh, I gave a lecture series this past winter here in Israel on uh, interesting people that we met on the way home, which uh, is a kosher way to say it's the history of Zionism without, without being Zionistic. So I'm um, Hashem successful. And a number of people told me that I should turn it into a book. So I've started on that. I don't know. We'll see what will happen. I don't see anymore. So, uh, you know, I. Rabos Machshavos Belevish. We'll see what will happen. Try to keep busy. Yeah, so Ryan, again, thank you so much. Uh, My pleasure. For today's interview. And Hashem God should just uh, let you go from uh, file to file. Oh, with, thank with, you. With a lot of good help. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll do it.